Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Julie Mann. Oh, that was difficult to say. And I show men and women how they can create healthy, happy, sustainable lives. And talking of sustainability, today I'm joined by Chris Poperin, who is a sustainability consultant. Hi, Chris. Hi, good morning. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Glad to be here. Good. So I'm just really curious to know to start with, whether you were interested in the environment as a child? I, I was in a lot of ways. I was definitely the tomboy climbing the trees and playing by the water. Um, I grew up in a family that would camp and spend a lot of time outside. Um, and um, I, I think with, with adventures that I've had since, being outside, enjoying the environment, um, that's something I very much like. Lovely. And did your parents teach you about the importance of, you know, taking care of our planet and kind of healthy habits around the environment? Yes and no. I grew up in a, in a traditional American Midwest um, middle, uh, middle income family um, in a lot of ways. And my, my dad had a TV repair shop. And so he'd fix electronics and all of that. Um, you know, this is back in the, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, when you could still fix different things. And so I think that was ingrained in me. Um, the, the house I grew up in was a, a fixer wrapper. It was old by, by Minnesota standards, uh, late 1800s. And so it was, it was both necessity and just the, the practicality of when something is crafted well, you take care of it. Um, especially since there isn't always a place for it to go at the end of its useful life. So that's such a great, thing to teach you isn't it you know to, to make sure you look after things and really value things mm -hmm. yeah but you know I guess we're in a bit of a throwaway culture aren't we but I think that's such a great thing to instill in you as a child so what beliefs did you inherit do you think Chris from your parents that you that still hold true for you that you still abide by yeah working hard definitely um I come I've got three brothers and so everybody had to had to do the chores and work on the house and help out with the projects of painting the house and taking care of you know the 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 property itself um that is definitely something um I'm going to hold on to that's that's ingrained in me something I want to pass on to my child um but then also kind of the understanding of, of community and so these resources come into to the neighborhood, the community. And then it, when, when something's no longer useful for us, we would either give it away to somebody else or we do an exchange with other families. And I think that that's important because especially from an environmental standpoint, you know, it, we're so often, as you talk about a disposable um, uh, mentality of, oh, great, it's broken. We, we throw it away or we just get a new one. And, that's there's real problems going on now um, in the environment because of that. Yeah, but also it's really great, isn't it, to make a difference in your community and to give back. I mean, some well, I, I can't remember what the phrase is, but some somebody else's rubbish is someone else's treasure or something like Absolutely. that. You know? I think that's yeah. so true. And and if if we can give something, it feels good, doesn't it, to do that? It does. It yeah. does, and it's more creative. When you're able to sit there and take something that was meant for one thing and use it for a completely different purpose, you upcycle it, you refurbish it, whatever it is, there's, there's a lot of pride in being able to bring some beauty and functionality to something that may not have been um, originally created for that purpose. Yeah, totally. So what kind of things challenged you, Chris, as you were growing up? Can you, rem can you remember anything in particular? Um, well, there was, there was four kids, and so everything was always a little bit of, a, of, a, um, of an effort to, to get and to make my voice heard. I was the only, the only daughter with, you know, three sons, um, and so I think that that kind of experience made me learn to, to have an opinion and figure out where I thought, of, what I, I thought about things, and then have to voice it, and sometimes have to voice it a little bit more loudly in order to be heard. Yeah. So tell us what happened when you left home and you started, you know, work. Tell us about that, that journey and what really led you to doing what you do now, which I know you're absolutely passionate about. Yeah. Um, so I went to, I, I was doing some studying abroad in different places. I studied in Spain for a while and then I went down to South America and I did Minnesota Studies in International Development. And so I actually lived with a Quechua community um, where they don't even speak Spanish, where they speak Quechua. 
in the Amazon for, um, for about five and a half months for that one part of it. And during that time, I got a real taste of what happens when you don't have infrastructure available. You've, people want things. They want to be able to go to the market and they want to say, okay, great. There's new shoes. There's a new shirt. There's all these different items that they can buy. And that part of capitalism has definitely influenced everywhere. It's permeated even there. Um, you might hear some thunder in the background. We've got a storm moving in. Um, but they didn't have any of the after effect. There was no way of getting rid of things. There's no recycling. There wasn't even, you know, you know, collections of trash to get rid of. So people would either burn it or they'd leave it on the ground. And a real pivot in, in my understanding of, of consumer goods, especially, was there wasn't the, the inherent understanding of the difference between an orange peel and a plastic bag. They'd both go on the ground. And it really took some deep conversations with, with these, these people of saying, the orange peel is going to go away in a couple of weeks. That plastic bag is never going to go away. And yet, you know, we think of disposability in the US or in Europe as being, you know, well, everybody just, you get a new bag. Every time you go into a store, you get these different items, you know, plastic water bottles. But when you start going into countries with less and less infrastructure to deal with it, the problem escalates um, much more quickly and much more visually. There is no way for it to go. Yeah, that must have been really shocking, I imagine, when you first experienced that. It did. I mean, it's, it really changed the perspective of, we have a house here, we have some land. If we cut down a tree, it's because, you know, either it's going to fall on the house or there's, there's a rationale behind it. And yet, from the perspective of being somebody in, in the developed world, the first world, whatever the, the, the nomenclature is about it now, um, it was heartbreaking to see a big, beautiful Amazonian tree be cut down for what was also very rational reasons. Um, and so it's really been kind of a mind shift of, you know, of these things are happening everywhere all the time in real time. And what are the, what are the biases that go into it? So five and a half months is not really very long to mm -hmm. make a difference, is it? Did you see no. some sort of difference in that time that you spent there? Um, I, I was able to work in a school where I was teaching um, kids a little bit of English because that's that's always a useful thing. I mean, it's it's always a, a hard cultural understanding of trying to bring in a new language, and yet the the doors open when you can speak more than one. Um, trying to just make these comments of you know how do you have that? I don't know how much of it it did. The the Amazon is expanding in such a, a, a so quickly. Um, the development that's happening in there you cut down one road and all of a sudden there's five more within a few days you know and it's it's um it five months is not nearly enough um i think it would take years to do and that would be definitely something that i hope somebody else can 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 take on yeah so what happened after that chris because it what it wasn't straight after that that you set up as an independent no, wasn't it? So what, what happened in between? Uh, I ended up going, um, moving from Minneapolis after I returned home from, from this trip and went to Denver, to the University of Denver. Um, I actually started a master's program in geography. So I was going to continue to work on frontier development patterns and deforestation. And then of course, 2007 hit and all the funding for my department was rescinded. And I was wondering, what am I gonna do? I'm on a quarter system. I can't transfer it to another school without losing all the credit that I'd earned. And so I switched into international business. I figured the best way to really try to make an impact in these areas is to learn business and learn why are these motivations, why are businesses making these decisions given these outcomes? Brilliant. And, and was it straight after that that you set up on your own or, or because it's a big thing isn't it to be an you know self-employed person it is it does take a lot of effort so um I ended up moving out to Connecticut which is where I am now and at the time um I was looking for sustainability jobs so either as a coordinator for a city or town or for a company um, kind of bringing in that, that expertise of the different programs that are available and the different, um, both that can be set up internally, but then also the resources that are available externally. And I wasn't finding any of them. And so I said, okay, well, I know that there are great projects I can be a part of. So I'm going to go into business for myself and see where I end up. 
and I've been, I launched in April of 2016, and here I am five years later. Brilliant. So most of us know a little bit, if not a lot for some people, about sustainability. So can you tell us something that might not be common knowledge, something that, you know, anyone watching might not have heard? Sure. We have, we have all this technology that's in our houses um, and in our buildings. The, the amount of energy that goes in, when we talk about energy efficiency, it's like, oh, what does it matter if a light bulb stays on or this or that? The reality is that anything that we touch that uses electricity, it takes three to four times that much energy to create it on the, in the source, wherever that is, a coal mine, a, uh, a solar array, whatever that is. And we lose three quarters of that just by getting it from that location to our use point. And so every single increment of, of reduced energy use that we have in our homes, at our work, is three to four times the impact at that source. Wow, that's a sobering thought, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Well, it also means though that little actions can really have big impacts. Yeah, absolutely, there's the upside. So if you could inspire the people watching in some way, Chris, sure. what is it that you really, really want to say? People need to stop thinking about sustainability as being trade-offs. It really is not trying to go back into the 1700s where everybody's living off the land and everything. It's really looking forward into the time of really brilliant, intelligent, innovative resource use. So let's look at all of these different habits that we've had from you know, agriculture to building structures to, to creating new um, products. And let's see how we can do them that really are the smartest way possible. And we are finding that out. There's a fantastic um, uh, resource that's out there, Project Drawdown. And it's not gonna be one item that's gonna fix this, the, the global these crises that we have of trash, of population, of climate change. It's gonna be a lot of these and it's gonna be all of us working on them. So there's excellent resources that are out there and you know, let's work on that butterfly effect. Make small changes in your life. You have no idea what kind of impact that's gonna end up making for somebody else in theirs. Yeah, I guess it is those consistent daily small changes, isn't it, that over time yes. add up to the big thing. So in a nutshell, Chris, what, what do you actually do? <laughs> um, I work on cool projects in the sustainability field. So I do everything from benchmarking and analysis of what businesses are doing. Um, another organization is a nonprofit in the um, sustainability field, and I do their back of end marketing, communications, website, social media work. And then I'm for another client, I'm working on building out a training platform that's available to bring in the really small business owners and make them aware of all the programs that are being offered for energy efficiency, for waste stream management, um, et cetera, from the utilities, because the the, the things are out there. The biggest issue is a, a lack of understanding of what's available, where, and, and how do you integrate it into your own business operations. So it's quite varied work mm -hmm. then. You've got to have quite a lot of yeah. skills. Apart from the knowledge, you've got to kind of implement it in, in, a, in a training program. I mean, that requires yeah. technical skills too, doesn't it? It, it, it does in a lot of ways. I, yeah. I definitely, um, I bring in the strategy, the background, understanding you know, how buildings work, for example, how uh, waste stream management works. And then for the super technical, I'm not a certified energy manager, for example, I would bring in some expertise on those, on those really technical ones, the ones that require licensing um, and those specialized skills. But the idea is we're looking at the impact. How can the business move forward? And I love working with partners on different projects to get the outcomes that we're looking for. Brilliant. So what would you say is your favorite aspect of what you do, Chris? Looking at the, the whole business and how it operates overall and seeing how these little tweaks can get, make big impacts on the bottom line, but more on the, the employee engagement and retention of people who are in there, the, the mind shift that happens of when you start doing training programs and work, um, that they, people bring those, those habits home and then they reinforce them at home and then they bring even better ones back to the workplace. Um, and so really just seeing how little, um, 
changes in perspective and understanding of what we can do can really make a bigger impact when it's amplified. Brilliant. In your opinion, why would you say that you are the person to work with? Because I've seen the result of what happens when we're not doing this very well. Um, for an individual business, my, my, my dad had a, this repair business. He didn't keep up with the market trends that were going on. And he ended up going out of business when, you know, everybody could just buy a new TV or a new laptop or a new whatever it was. Um, and so uh, understanding that, understanding where these things go in a global perspective, um, you know, seeing that, you know, there, we can't just throw things away because there's no way for them to go. Um, having that real contextual understanding, plus, you know, the technical skills, the MBA, the, the background in marketing, the background in these areas, um, and, and especially training of other people on how to do this, puts me in the position to really assess what's going on and then give step-by-step -step implementation um, uh, processes to, to make sure that you get the outcomes that you're looking for. Brilliant. I know that you're mother to a very young son aren't you yes i have a two-year-old <laughs> two-year-old yes how exciting how exciting for him particularly you know how wonderful the world is at two years old um what other things do you do when you're not working <laughs> um i miss traveling um i've been to 15 odd countries um about two and a half years abroad so i love traveling i love being able to see how other people think and the cultures that come with them and the food they eat and, and all of that. Um, and then, but really, you know, I, I, I like picking these projects. I like being able to work on the type of, no month is ever the same twice. I'm working on one project for, for several months. I'm working for another one, several months. Um, but, you know, between, between work and having, traveling when we can, having a toddler and um, everything else, just being able to, to enjoy talking to friends is something I love doing when I get the chance. Wonderful. One final question, Chris. When you're no longer on this planet, how would you like to be remembered? As somebody who is very passionate about what they do, because this idea that we can just push off all of these challenges to the next generation doesn't work anymore. I want my son to see these, what I'm trying to do. And I hope that when the world that he inherits by the time he's my age is a better option than all the possibles that are out there. Perfect. It's been really fascinating and uh, educational thank talking you. to you, Chris. So all I can say is Chris Coparin, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much for having me.